Well, we all knew Milton Friedman as a great public intellectual. He was also a superb macroeconomist. He made many important scientific contributions to this field that have had a, um, a remarkable and enduring impact. His scholarly legacy continues to spark the University of Chicago's strength in macroeconomics under the recent le leadership of Bob Lucas and other eminent scholars. In his Nobel address, Friedman reminded us the importance of scientific endeavor as the essential foundation for the assessment and design of economic policy. This perspective helps us to define the research mission of the Becker Friedman Institute, and that's why we support and nurture innovative and rigorous economic analysis in the pursuit of important policy questions. Friedman's research pushed the economics profession to think of macroeconomic policy, in particular monetary policy, in terms of rules rather than discretion. It pushed us to understand the mechanism by which macroeconomic policies have important consequences for the overall economy. It pushed us to think about the important interactions between monetary and fiscal policy. And finally, it pushed us to, to think about the connections between macroeconomic policy and financial markets. Today, we have an opportunity to explore some of these issues in, the broader, um, <coughs> in both a broader historical context and in the context of our recent financial turbulence and accompanying major recession. But recent experience and the evolution of financial markets will lead us to investigate some new que uh, questions as well. The Becker Friedman Institute has launched a variety of research initiatives, including interconnected projects that relate directly to this panel discussion. One on fiscal imbalance, and a second one on modeling linkages between the macroeconomy and financial markets. These topics embed some of the most challenging and complex economic policy issues we face today. This evening, we have three distinguished panelists who are guide our uh, exploration on these important issues related to financial markets and the macroeconomy. We are lucky to have one of the two most um, recent Nobel laureates, Tom Sargent, who did pathbreaking work on fiscal policy consequences on the overall economy and its implications and the implications of the intertemporal nature of the uh, government's budget constraint. While Tom is on the faculty at NYU, he is also a distinguished fellow, uh, uh, fellow of the Becker Friedman Institute and a leader in our initiative on fiscal imbalance. We are also fortunate to have Augustine Karstens, who is currently the um, governor of the Bank of Mexico. He has a distinguished career in economic policy with an international perspective. He was just named Central Banker of the Year as, uh, in, in, uh, by, uh, uh, by Banker Magazine. <laughs> so he can't beat that. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> and he's an eminent uh, uh, alumnus of the economics department at the University of Chicago. Finally, we're pleased to have Myron Schultz, who won the Nobel Prize in 1997 for his seminal work on pricing derivative claims in financial markets, including in particular the pricing of options. Myron was on the faculty at the University of Chicago in the 1970s, and he has remained a valuable friend and supporter of the university. Um, as Kevin pointed out, there's, uh, the, 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 our approach to events is rather decentralized, so uh, uh, this, is, this is also the case across panels. Uh, there's different rules for this one. The first one is the only one who gets to give a speech is me, and my speech is about over. Um, <laughs> instead, we're going to have a sequence of questions, which I'm going to uh, address to the uh, different panelists and hope to generate some discussion. Um, so in the first part, I will direct some questions. And then at the end, I will open up some, uh, 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 some time at the end for questions from the audience. I will direct questions to an initial panelist, but uh, uh, then open it up for other ones to comment. So, so to get us started, in Friedman's own research, he was keenly aware of the interactions between monetary policy and fiscal policy and argued that, uh, that an important concern in the design of monetary policy should be to help discipline fiscal policy. Following this, I would like to lead off today's second panel um, with a, di a discussion of fiscal policy. So let me address the following to Tom Sargent. The recent financial crisis has brought to the forefront a variety of fiscal challenges. For instance, what are the consequences of U.S. fiscal policy for long-term inflation and growth? What are the consequences of fiscal decentralization on the European Union? What lessons from historical episodes and time series evidence are germane for addressing these questions? <laughs> <laughs> and please limit your answer to uh, seven minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so this might, this is... This might not be much, much of an answer. Um, so, so 
Let me tell you about a, one of the last conversations I had with Milton Friedman. Um, I asked him why, um, in the late 70s, um, conservatives were advocating a uh, balanced budget amendment for the United States, and then why, when we spoke shortly before he died, you hadn't heard that from, that from conservatives for a long time. And we talked a little bit about that. <coughs> um, you know, the United States federal government does not have balanced budget amendments, but many, most state constitutions in the United States do have uh, they're not balanced budget amendments. They're part of the Constitution. Um, so I want to mention where that, where, where those things came from. And uh, um, this is, I told you it wasn't going to be much of an answer. So, <laughs> so, but it's gonna, it's, it, it reminds, this question reminds me of Europe now. Um, so then the second thing I want to say about Milton Friedman is that he, I heard him say several times um, that uh, crises, uh, problems, ongoing problems aren't solved by governments until there's eventually a crisis. And I'll link, I want to link this. So, um, so let me tell you a little story. It's a true story. Um, not that the stories in the previous panel weren't true. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least not all of them. So um, about, two, about two bailouts. So, um, and there, bailouts are a big topic in Europe now, and it's kind of rude for an American to talk to them. So I'll talk about bailouts of my own country. So, so, so the United States um, Constitution and the first administration, the United States was born in a massive bailout of uh, state debts. So if you remember, so, we, so we, we had two constitutions. We had the Articles of Confeder Confederation. That, that was our constitution. And that was set up, I think of it as Ronald Reagan's dream. Because it's constraining, it's constraining the federal government to uh, have so unable to raise revenues they have to get revenues from the individual states that, uh, the, that the federal government can't finance its, its debts. And it has big debts. And the states have big debts um, that are accumulated from financing a revolution. And those debts are going at deep discount. OK, so the question is 1780s. Is there, was there a fiscal crisis in the 70, 1780s? Well, if you're a taxpayer, not much of a crisis. But if you're a creditor of the government, there's a big crisis. So, um, not a Marxist, but um, um, what basic story of the Constitution is the creditors of the government um, pull off a, f a political revolution. There was a crisis, and they write a new Constitution. And the, and the Constitution, you, you can, a Alexander Hamilton, he's a 32-year-old kid, he tells you what he's doing. And part of, part of the combination of the Constitution and the first acts of Congress in August 1790. It's a grand bargain. The federal government bails out 100% all the states. It assumes the state government debt. And it also, uh, as part of the deal, it gets the ability, it gets the monopoly on the ability to raise the one tax that raises substantial revenues. And that's the tariff. So under the Articles of Confederation, the central government couldn't re have a tariff. Um, the states did. So, so that gets consolidated. So, um, so then what happens is the uh, federal government raises revenues and it uses a substantial part of them to finance, to service the debt. And, and so what happens is those debts that had gone in deep discount, don't think of Europe today, suddenly went back to par. Huge capital gains. There's fantastic discussions about debates between Madison and, and Hamilton about uh, should you really pay off all those debts because it's costly. And it's not fair to pay them off. Because some people have bought those things at deep discount. Ha Madison wanted to discriminate among them. And Hamilton, this 32-year-old kid, says, if you discriminate, I, he says, I want to make this a, a liquid market so that the guys who buy the debt in the future are going to be sure that they can. So think about There's people talking about haircuts in Europe. Same discussions going on. So we're born in a big, so what happens is we run a, um, a big enough state um, to service those debts. So why did Hamilton do that? He says why he wants to do it. He wants to create a reputation for the government to pay its debts, <clears throat> even at the cost of bailing out these states. And there's some rhetoric about why they did it. They said, well, we're bailing them out because it was a public good. Those state debts were incurred mainly to finance the war. It was a public good. 
the glorious cause to get the British out. And so there was a reason. Whether that was rhetoric or, okay, so anyway, so we paid a big cost to gain a reputation. Now, you also gain, you gain two reputations. You, you went, one reputation was with the creditors, the other was perhaps with the states, because you bailed them out once. Now, okay, so I won't tell you the whole story, although it's a fascinating story, because you write a constitution and it's not the end of the matter, because constitutions are partly written at one time in the United States and they're partly evolved. Lots of things were unsettled. One thing was unsettled was, well, what kind of fiscal union was it? What, was it? We had a fiscal union, but what kind of things could the federal government do? So should the federal government uh, finance public goods like roads, railroads, and canals? Big debate. Um, the guys who say they shouldn't finance them win. Uh, that's what Jackson's all about. There's a bunch of vetoes from Madison and Monroe vetoing public goods. And then what happens is the states start financing public goods. States do not have balanced budget amendments in their constitutions. They do not at the beginning. You look at all the beginning state constitutions. So what happens is they, f they, um, they start uh, financing public goods, railroads, canals, uh, on the theory that they're going to pay for themselves. They're going to pay for themselves because they're going to generate revenues, they're going to raise property values, taxes are going to roll in. And uh, so they do it. Uh, big state debts, eight, 1830s. Uh, there's, there's a big financial crisis. I'll have to tell you about it. Uh, the debts go belly up. Um, big discounts. A lot of them are bought by the Europeans who don't even realize that we have individual states in the United States. Um, they think, by the way, read the 11th Amendment. The 11th Amendment, it's the first thing after the, it, what it does is it says that um, a creditor cannot enforce a contract against a state government in a federal court. You've got to go to a state court. There's no investor protection for state bonds. It's a, it's a footnote in our Constitution, the 11th Amendment. So what happens is they go belly up, can't enforce them, and now, now uh, the creditors and the states go to uh, Congress and say, you bailed us out once, you had your, the, uh, and um, are you going to do it again? And there's a big debate, and guess what? They don't do it. They let them go belly up. And the consequence is that um, the United States federal government gains the reputation with the states that it's not going to bail them out at considerable cost to even federal debt in Europe because Europe doesn't make the distinction. So, um, so this is a story about two bailouts and two stories about interconnected reputations. And okay, uh, and, I'll, and I'll conclude by saying what about my, um, <laughs> my uh, conversation with Milton Friedman about balanced budget amendments and about the thing about the crises. Well, after the states went belly up, many, many states rewrote their constitutions. And at that time, they put in balanced budget amendments. And by the way, balanced budget amendments, they're a bad idea. Because um, the basic consumption smoothing model is people, it's good if you can borrow. If you, have the, if you, can, if you make good on your ability to pay, it's good because you can you don't have to match the expenditures to the revenues. So, so um, um, but the states realized they couldn't be tr trusted uh, to pay off their debts, so that's when they put those balanced budgets amendments in. So, the little, so Milton Friedman was right, that's just one example where there's a, where there's a crisis um, that uh, produces a solution to a problem and uh, it produces actually a political revolution because rewriting a constitution that's a, that's a political revolution. Um, so, um, Europe, <laughs> I don't have time to talk about Europe. <laughs> Great. Uh, do any of the other panelists like to talk about Europe or something else related to fiscal, <laughs> fiscal policy? Augustin? At this stage or? I, it's, it's a free option, you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, there is a lot to be said about Europe. I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk about it now or I wait until you ask me the question or... <laughs> you can wait if you prefer. <laughs> no, if you want, I can give you my thoughts about Europe. I don't mind. Feel free. Okay. But, I mean, uh, everybody gives opinions about the problems. Uh, having as reference its own opinions and in, in its own... I would say knowledge that you have acquired, in my case, 
uh, to more than anything by doing policy. I come from Mex Mexico. Uh, I was one of the fortunate uh, foreigners that came to the US to learn and to learn something useful. And in that sense, I'm very grateful to the University of Chicago. Um, now, what, do I, who, what is the way I see the problem of uh, Europe? In Latin America, for the 70s, 80s, uh, mostly in some countries in the 90s, uh, we had sequential cri financial crisis. And I would say that the main issue was that we had very inconsistent macroeconomic policies. Uh, in all, the, all those problems were uh, analyzed, and uh, I would say the main issue was the fact that we chose exchange rate regimes uh, that had some commitment by the monetary authorities to keep the exchange rate behaving in some particular way. And what we needed to do is basically to adjust all the rest of policies to become consistent with that exchange rate rule. And sequentially, we failed. Now, what has Europe done? Europe did, I would say, the ultimate fix. Not only they fixed among one country to another, a bilateral fix, but if they fixed 17 countries together. So what you need to do, basically, to make that fiscal, that exchange rate arrangement to be sustainable to time is to guarantee that the policies, the macro policies of the 17 countries will be consistent with that exchange rate arrangement. And if, it, if many countries fail to do it on a bilateral basis, it's not that difficult to think that this exchange rate regime would be challenged at some point in time. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. No? I mean, basically, the market is having a speculative attack against Europe. Because basically, they're saying, are, are you, go, as time passes, it becomes harder and harder for the market to believe that at some point, the policies that are on their place will be consistent with that regime. No? Now, of course, there's still room, there's still time for them to fix the matter. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, their regime still hasn't collapsed, but they really have to uh, act very quickly in a coordinated fashion to try to reestablish the equilibrium between their exchange rate commitment and the macro policies that they're following. That's the way I see Europe in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> well, seeing, seeing Europe in five minutes is difficult, but um, I guess the issue is in, in terms of, uh, from a financial perspective, the idea is we have never been able to define the difference between liquidity and solvency, and the idea in terms of most of the European situation is to think about whether this is a liquidity issue or whether there's countries that are actually have debts that exceed their ability or willingness to repay their debts. And uh, how do you define those two things is very difficult because obviously the central bankers or the policy people think that okay, speculators are attacking them and they love markets when they're working in their favor and they hate markets when they're trying to discipline them. And there's this uh, asymmetry. So the idea is that the speculators or others is the, are attacking uh, these particular <coughs> um, bonds and, uh, uh, of these countries, and yet it's the case that uh, if it's deemed to be a liquidity problem, then somehow the central bank can uh, provide liquidity to the system and the speculators will. Uh, disappear. But if there's really a fundamental problem in Europe that there's uh, various countries that are illiquid, uh, that are insolvent, then the question is how do you get around the insolvency problem? And either you do it in uh, the ways we've done it in the past, which is the default on your bonds, or try to inflate out of uh, the particular problem, um, or you can try to grow yourself out of the problem. But the problem is it's very difficult to do that. And the uh, issue for a lot of the countries within the 17 is that there's not the homogeneity that, or the conditions necessary to think of there as being a valid fiscal union, which is the idea of mobility of labor and mobility of capital and rules that actually foster 
investment and uh, proper levels of consumption. And if it's the case that if one of the countries or several of the countries want to use the largest uh, largest of uh, of other countries to support them, then basically that they'll continue to survive as long as it's the case that people are willing to support them. You know, and it's the idea is that. Uh, I think that in Europe at the current time, there's really a solvency problem for various of these countries, and that uh, if they're not going to have transfers, or that countries are, such as Germany or, or other countries are not willing to transfer to the periphery countries, such as Greece, Italy, uh, Spain, um, uh, and uh, Portugal, Ireland, then it's either going to if they're not willing to transfer, then the only thing left is actually to see these countries will leave that leave the euro, and it's going to be in their interest to do such and not stay in. As long as someone wants to continue to pay you to stay in by having transfers, then there's an incentive to do such. And there's that economic trade-off, and Germany obviously wants to put in constraints, such as austerity programs and the like, which will cause them not to have to transfer as much, and this all has to be worked out. I think my own prediction. Uh, don't write this down, but my own prediction, <laughs> my own prediction is that one to three countries will leave the euro within 18 months. Thank you. So let me change gears out here a little bit. Um, as I indicated, Milton Friedman made fundamental contributions to the design of monetary policy and to the role of central banks in its, um, in its implementation. <coughs> The advancement and expansion of the financial sector engaged in banking activities presents new challenges uh, to, bank, to banking regulations. And this leads me to ask uh, August to the following. Part, uh, part of the role of central banks is to promote financial stability, in, the, in, in part by regulating the behavior of banks. Financial activities have been broad in recent years with the emergence of the so-called shadow banking sector. This creates interesting challenges for financial regulation. So what financial activities should be re regulated and what responsibility should monetary policy authorities take in implementing this regulation? Well, um, obviously, it, a lot of this uh, is, is uh, I would say, the question comes a little bit to make a thought process on the recent crisis. There is no doubt that something went wrong, uh, not only by a small amount, but it was a, a major, major crisis. Uh, Certainly, there was a major failure of regulation and supervision in the financial system. A part of that uh, was responsibility of the central bank, part of, of, of that not. And uh, I will, in a few minutes, give some comments about how should central banks uh, uh, react to the, or more than anything, contribute to prevent this to happen, uh, at least in, in this magnitude. I think we always will have financial crisis. Uh, because basically that's in the nature of the activity, but certainly we have to look into how can we prevent such a violent crisis to happen again. I think that, that if we want to know how to move forward, we have to identify what, what really went wrong. You know? and of course, I can give you a very detailed list of what has been discussed in the Basel Committee, in the Financial Stability Board, in the IMF, and so on, but I think that the key aspect is how to address risk. Uh, we made a, as, as the keystone of our regulation what is the capital to asset ratio. And for that, basically, it's just a very simple ratio of risk-weighted tax assets to capital. And I think that both in the way risk-weighted assets were measured and in the way capital was conceptualized turned out to be completely wrong. Uh, I think in terms of risk-weighted assets, the, there was, I would say, a, a very large underestimation of risk. Uh, basically, the standard te techniques for risk measurement were path dependent, and the fact that for a very long period of time we didn't have surprises, everything was nice and dandy. We thought that, you know, in many activities, risk was not present any longer or was really small, uh, was in a way, uh, was a perception that came deeply in, ingrained, no? And therefore, what these risk-weighted assets and asso its association with capital 
was it disrupted, and at the end of the day, several externalities took place. One is risk was completely mispriced, and that generated huge disbalances in financial markets. Uh, the second uh, also was that the amount of capital that was supposed to be sufficient was not. And he, this lends me to move to the next issue, which is uh, capital. No, basically, uh, as we know, know today, capital in, in, in its basic definition that was previous, these Basel III arrangements, didn't have the loss absorbency capacity that it was supposed to, to have. Uh, and there was also the issue, not only of the quality of capital, but also of the amount of capital. So basically, we need to to continue working on those two major measurements that are essential for the modern regulation. Risk weighted assets depend a lot on what is called value at risk, which basically is a methodology that depends on past history. In the most recent discussions on Basel and so on, we have moved to a definition of called stressed value at risk, which basically try to incorporate what is uh, pretty much unknown or what uh, the, the information we lose when we only uh, estimate based on the past and we don't incorp incorporate contingencies or events or known events that might happen in the future. Uh, I think also uh, the, the, the relationship between market risk and credit risk has been enhanced. Uh, so different, through different fashions, uh, the measurement of risk and the association of risk with capital is trying to be enhanced. I also think that a lot of, of the problem was that the complexity of transactions and interconnectedness has made the management of banks and man management of non-bank institutions tremendously complex and even more the regulation of them. Uh, there the, 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 the idea is to sort of keep it simple as much as possible, but that is a really huge challenge. Uh, and another, another important risk that I think was also dramatically underestimated, not only the credit risk, but also liquidity risks. No? Uh, liquidity was not regulated appropriately. Uh, again, we were sort of fooled by the fact that, that for a very long period of time where there were not major shocks present, uh, markets were extremely liquid and you could move your positions uh, and fund your positions and therefore you could do very dramatic maturity transformation very, very easily. No? And what we have find, found out is that liquidity dries up dramatically very, very soon, especially if it's associated with other other macroeconomic risks. Therefore, a lot of work on the regulation also has to uh, be done through, through liquidity regulation. Um, I don't know how much I'm doing in time. I can keep talking. <laughs> you, are the, you are the cop here, so you have to tell me. How about, uh, how about a couple more minutes? A couple of more minutes, OK. Um, let me just finish with two comments. One. Uh, it's very difficult to think, it's a very difficult to think that we in the public sector, in the government uh, uh, arena, we will be able to get it absolutely right. I mean, at the end of the day, and here I come with what Gary said in a such an emphatic way and something I learned in the University of Chicago, there is a lot of incentives here that the industry needs to have. Also for them, have much better self-regulation. We just cannot think that the government will have the ability and the capability of fully and absolutely isolate uh, the risks in the financial systems. So I think that the industry also has to do a major thought process on how to rethink their model, their business model, and how can they also help us in a way to introduce more check and balances at the industry level, where I also think things didn't go the way they were supposed to, to go. So I finish here. Okay. Okay. <laughs>
Um, I'm going to, before I let the other one speakers talk, I, I, I want to amplify on this question a little bit, because since it's pretty much now become blurred with the next one. And so <clears throat> this is a little bit of a re reaction to Augustine. When, you know, when Friedman explored the design of monetary policy, he argued for the use of simple policy rules as, um, because of what he famously referred to as long and variable lags in the, in, in the, in the transition, transmission mechanism by which monetary policy influenced macroeconomic outcomes. Basically, what he argued is the fact that our knowledge was incomplete and our existing, met and, and, and our existing met models were not up to the task of designing complicated rules via some type of formal and detailed analysis. So this kind of gets me back to this question about financial market regulation. And in particular, let me, since we've come close to this, let me put the Dodd-Frank bill on the front and center here as well. <laughs> Uh, the recent Dodd-Frank bill creates a Financial Stability Oversight Council, well, supported by an Office of Financial Research. The council is charged with, in quotes, identifying threats to the financial stability of the United States, promoting market discipline, and responding to emerging risks to the stability of the United States financial system. So now I, you know, I wonder, to, can, can such a council have a real chance of identifying systemic risks sufficiently far in advance for there to be meaningful responses? How can these responses be designed so as to promote market discipline? And we might even start by how do we actually quantify notions of systemic risk and is this a, a concept which is a, a pertinence for regulation? So why don't I ask <laughs> Myron to take a shot at this? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. It's all because of derivatives. <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> Get rid of me and you're all right. <laughs> the first law. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, it's interesting because uh, regulators and central bankers had no clue as to bank risk leverage and the value of their guarantees for the last crisis. So um, by setting up the systemic risk console, I don't have an expectation that they would be able to, again in the future, uh, be able to predict when uh, something is systemic if we are able to define exactly what systemic is. And no one has really yet uh, defined systemic. I mean, we know the, what last time happened, but the question is, is that going to be what happens in the future? And that might not be the case. Well, we, if you study what happened last time, as we know, then uh, basically it doesn't necessarily forecast uh, the future. So, and also, too, the bank leadership in uh, many of the banks in the United States and uh, around the world also had no idea as to their risks and here that they were uh, heavily involved in actually managing uh, the banks. And um, one of the reasons we have to understand is that uh, hunters go where the meat is, you know, and the, and the hunters like volatility and they like to make money. So we have the hunters and farmers and the farmers in the banking organizations uh, to be to the, are the infrastructure people and the control people while the hunters are trying to figure out all the new innovation, the products in which they can make money. Now, uh, the problem is that uh, in financial innovation or innovation where you have a lot of volatility and change, it's going to be the case that the, the, uh, uh, far the farmers or the ordinance people are going to be behind the hunters or the war generals, okay? And basically, that trying to keep that in balance is just very difficult, and regardless of whether you have systemic risk regulators or not. And it's obvious that the hunters decided to put uh, farmers in charge of the organization who had no idea what the risks were so they can run their departments in their groups <laughs> unabetted, okay, and be able uh, to make money. Now, another issue that we have is that Carson brought this up, was that we observed in the past that volatility was low, okay? And that if volatility is low, then we sort of know the envelope theorem in economics is that you take more risk if volatility is low. Now the question is, if you observe that volatility is low, then if we're going to forecast volatility is going to continue to be low in the future, or another uh, analogy is if you're driving down the highway and you notice that everyone's driving quickly because volatility is low, the road is clear, does that mean that you as well drive quickly because they know something you don't know, okay? And basically you buy information under uncertainty and the world is very complex from those who are driving fast. Or, as Carson said, that everyone was stupid 
<laughs> they're driving fast because they're going to crash. Okay? Now, obviously, there's a, there's a conundrum. You're, are you forced to drive quickly because everyone else in the banks are driving quickly and you'll be left behind? And there, you know it's wrong, but hopefully you'll get out before everyone else does. Or is it the case you assume that other people know and you drive quickly because they know something you don't know? Or if you don't drive as fast as them, you'll be run over. So uh, those are the arguments. But when you get over the hill and there's an accident, occurs it's very hard because of negative convexity and because to adjust, the adjustment costs get large if everyone is trying to adjust at the same time. Okay? And you can't stop. So a big accidents occur. So that is really some of the fundamental problems. So if you have this idea of the systemic risk regulator, what they've actually done is made the system worse because what they've done is cemented in the too big to fail. If you define someone as being systemically important, okay, what does that mean? It means that basically you're going to bail them out. So that means the person who's going to be bailed out is going to know you're going to be bailed out and take additional risk. Okay? Instead of going the opposite way of saying no one's too, if something is too big to fail, it has to be too big. You know, because that means we have to bail them out. So <laughs> basically, um, it's a real fundamental problem. And so as a result of this, uh, in my view, that um, we ran, look, at the time of the crisis itself, we weren't set up to handle it, uh, let markets handle it at that juncture, so we stepped in. But we didn't do much thereafter to let markets work, okay, to figure out exactly how to create the monitors in the system that would, uh, would make that work. And so the question you raised, let's see, I wrote a few um, uh, points. Okay, there's no market discipline as long as the debt holders believe they're going to be bailed out by the government. Okay, maybe there's people who are uninformed, such as depositors who have their deposits, and that could be a, a money market account or a separate account, because the banks could actually raise money. So as long as debt holders believe they're not going to be bailed out by the government, you know, then they have, there's no discipline, because they, they don't have to worry about controls. The accounting system is very bad. And if you look at the financial health of a bank today, they eliminated mark-to-market rules. You can't read the balance sheet of a, of a J.P. Morgan, uh, one of our largest banks, and understand anything. I mean, the accounting system is completely wrong for today's world. It has no change in it. There's no way an outsider can look at it and understand the risk of a J.P. Morgan or any other bank within the system. And also, the regulators are not held accountable in any way uh, for anything that happens in the system and ha they don't have sufficient skills to understand this very complex bank. Um, they're there in many ways unless you get a few people who are very dedicated to serving society, which there are, but many of them are obviously there to get a job and, you know, as a stepping stone to the future. So we can't allow it to be the case that regulators are going to be able to understand this. And also, um, they uh, leverage rules and margin rules at the particular banking organization conditional on going to bail them out. You have to impose speed limits. You can't allow these, uh, this to go forward if you're going to bail someone else. You have to have some constraints on the, on the system. So I think that uh, and a main problem we have is, is that the opportunity set changes and the cost of adjustment changes. They're not constant over time. And if the cost of adjustment and the opportunity set changes, then the idea is figuring out how to be able to aggregate risks in our society. I might plan my risks as an entity, take account of my risks, and I think, for example, that I can sell my house in a very short period of time, well, if everyone else is trying to reduce their risk simultaneously, then it's going to be very difficult. And we don't understand the intermediation process under uncertainty. To intermediate in our society, to enter markets or intermediate in any business, the business needs a fixed point. You can't just do change. So you intermediate to a fixed point. If it's all just change, then you don't intermediate because you need some anchor to know that some, if I intermediate here, if I buy inventory today, I'm going to be able to sell it tomorrow. 
and I'm gonna sell at a higher price, I can sell it next month or six months from now. But you have to have some feeling of what you're gonna be able to sell it at to be able to intermediate. So as a result, if uh, shocks occur in the system, then we lose the fixed point and counter time is actually much faster in that world and decision time because financial institutions as everyone else gear their human capital or their teams to handle a typical volatility or needs. When things are too volatile, they don't have the capital or the people involved to be able to handle that, so it takes them more time. And finance, financial markets are volatility time. You know, it's, if the volatility is large, time is compressed. If volatility is small, time is expanded. And so we plan for not the peak load pricing problem, the peak load problem, we plan for normal volatility. So we're always going to have these shocks because the world doesn't present, we measure things in calendar time, but it's really volatility time. Did you? Yeah, I have it. Okay. So, have it. Tom? <clears throat> so, so there's, a, there's a basic issue. Um, that's running through this conversation, and that's where to draw the line between money and credit, socially. And I just want to recommend two readings on that. So one is uh, Milton Friedman's uh, program for monetary stability, and in the first, in the first page, first three or four pages, he's he's gonna he 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 recommends drawing a line in a very strict way, and he's going to have a hundred percent reserves for for banks that are issuing things that claim to be money. And then outside that, anything goes. And then he, he discusses the virtues and defects of this proposal. He's, he has a really interesting footnote. He said, um, so, so this is 100% this reserves. Make no mistake about it. It's, it's, it's giving the government a monopoly on the issue, the right to issue currency. Um, so, so in a footnote, Friedman says he has, um, he has some doubts. And the doubts are, there's a paper by Gary Becker, which he cites. <laughs> and the doubts are completely the opposite. Instead of a monopoly, government monopoly, have completely free banking. No deposit insurance, no lender of last resort, complete banking. And, um, um, and he said, that may work too. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then, and then, what's beautiful about these, what's beautiful about those, is those are the poles. They're both easy to understand. Uh, Becker's thing has the rec um, Badgett mentioned Becker's thing <laughs> earlier, and he said that would be the ideal system, a system of com small competitive banks where depositors, and he said depositors are doing the um, monitoring, and he called it, he had a great phrase, preservative apprehension. <laughs> and um, so those, those things are easy to understand. I actually, I know that you like, President Zimmer likes to read economics. <laughs> these, are, these are good things to read. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so these things are easy to understand. The stuff these guys are talking about and that Lars is talking about are like in the middle somewhere and they're, um, they're complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the point is, the problem is that you can, sure, you can say that, but you, isn't it the case that there's a demand side, what corporations and entities need for their business activities as opposed to saying, let's define a structure? The question is, what role should the government have in these activities? I thought Becker's proposal was let the market decide. If, if people want if no. people, if, if people to buy hedge funds, let them do it. Well, fine, as, you don't, as long as you let them fail. <laughs> no, you have to let them fail. That's what I'm saying. And then what I learned, from, what I learned from Kevin t today is if, there's a, if, if people want to buy those hedge funds, um, they're gonna, there's going to be a supply. Or <laughs> 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 well, the supply will reduce the price. That's what he said. Well, he didn't uh, say well, the return. <laughs> Okay, I propose you go on to the next question. <laughs> well, may I, may I say something? Sure, please. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I certainly agree with a lot of what Marion has, has said. I mean, the, the, the real problem is that we have, you know, in the, in the government, uh, in the regula regulatory and supervisory area, is that we have to deal 
with real problems that are in front of us right now. And I mean, certainly, uh, uh, the science and the institute can do a lot to try to sort out many of these things. I think a lot of the discussions in the nature of what Myron is, has been uh, making his case right now, we have been discussing them. But then we have a practical problem in front of us, and that is what to do. Now, in terms of too big to fail, I mean, what, what, what is being decided right now, I mean, certainly is to in, in improve a lot this capitalization ratio. And there is a surcharge for too big to fail. But that's, and that's for large systemic uh, 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 financial institutions. And I, I certainly take your point that at least many of them have uh, co coincided that being coined a, a CIFI, which is systemically important financial institution, is more a plus than a minus because it might, might give the impression that, that at, at some point you will be systemically important and you, it will, you'll be bailed out. But something that, that you, don't need, you don't need to ignore, and that is something that the international community is working very, very hard, is to, to work at the same time in the issue of bank resolution, which is, in a way, what you're saying. I mean, at some point, you have to let this institution fail. Now, it is a problem today, and we, we have seen it, for example, with Lehman Brothers, that it's not that simple, and it, it can generate huge externalities to let a big financial systemic institution fail. We are not prepared for that. No? So here, together with those surcharges and those regulatory measures, there is a lot of work that is underway now to do, uh, to, to set an appropriate bank resolution uh, uh, arrangement. Now, that is extremely difficult. If it's difficult from a national perspective, it's even more difficult from an international uh, perspective. And now that we have global financial institutions to sort of put together uh, the legal structure to, to, to bring down one of these monster institutions is a tremendous task. But together, therefore, with, with this designation of CIFI and, and with the additional capital charge, there is also a lot of work being done to try to be, from a more practical point of view, from a down-to-earth point of view, how can a, a, a bank of this magnitude being put out of business and how it can be unwinded in, so, in an orderly way, in such a way that it doesn't generate a huge social cost that a, a simple bankruptcy of, a, of an institution right, but, but, can generate. But you don't need to put a bank, kill the darn thing. I mean, it's, there's debt holders and equity holders. If it has a franchise in some way that it has value and it can survive, the bankruptcy procedure, if we learn how to make the bankruptcy procedure better so the debt holders who are not mom and pop depositors who are financing these activities, just like they finance hedge funds or others, they would suffer loss. If equity holders suffer a lot and debt holders suffer a lot, you can go to bankruptcy and, and, and it'll reorganize itself. And the debt holders will take over and go for it. You don't have to eliminate the darn, darn thing. It's, that, it that's... means it's gone from the point of view of the liability claims are changed. But the value of the company doesn't necessarily have to be liquidated. General Motors, for example, if it went into bankruptcy, it could have been refinanced and gone for it. You didn't have to have it bailed out, presumably, to have General Motors survive. That's what it never has the, done that in the past. What is, that is precisely that the, the objective, no? I mean, how can you do it in such a way that, that you can also prepare the exit? I mean, obviously, by Chapter 11 here in the US has been, if you compare it to many other economies in the world, it works relatively well. And why? Because we know from a market that when you enter into a market in a capitalist society, you have to also see how it goes out of business. No? And in the financial system, we are not at that point. And I think we need to move in that direction. And partial solutions, as, as you are saying, I think it's perfectly acceptable. OK, let me go on with one, um, one final question that will no doubt have even simpler answers for it. <laughs> 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 there, there appear to be substantial uncertainty in projecting or guessing about future government policies, including fiscal policies both here and abroad. What, what impact do you think this uncertainty has for the performance of the macroeconomy? Uh, I'll lead off with Tom. 
I guess, I guess I don't know. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> Further study. <laughs> so, Peter. So, I, I get. I, I, so, part of the uncertainty now is, is. Um, no, it's it's over. It's how big the federal government's going to. So, we have uncertainty about a lot of things, like like that they don't have. For example, in Chile, Ch Chile is has solved uh, or come to agreements about lots of things we haven't come. For, for example, they have, a, they, don't, they have a debt GDP ratio of uh, 7% if you measure it wrong. If you measure it right, it, they have a, it's minus 8%. Um, they have, they have a privatized social security, um, which, is, which has various internal incentives to uh, make it sustainable. Um, they have uh, a medical care funding system. They, have, they actually have a public option that competes with the private, and it's, it's sustainable. Um, they, have, they have timing protocols in, um, in their annual budget cycle that uh, are, are just naturally going to balance the budget over the business cycle, just like Milton Friedman said. So, um, so on, on, all, on each one of those, um, this country is involved in a struggle. So, so pe a lot of people say, this is a phrase I don't like, um, our current policy is unsustainable. Uh, that's, that just can't be true because, because budget can, you, have, you have a paper on this. Gary has another paper on this. Um, <laughs> one thing you have to agree on is there are budget constraints. So, so budget, the intertemporal budget constraint will be satisfied, so it's sustainable. What they mean when they say it's not sustainable is the published figures by the OMB and those things, the things in the status quo law, Bunch of promises have been been made which aren't compatible. Promises have been made to taxpayers by by Obama and Bush that aren't consistent with the promises that are made for entitlements and other things. So those promises are going to be broken. So so now the quite so so the debate, which is actually coming more into more into public, is what the size of the U.S. government is going to be, and um, and what the size of some state governments are going to be. Because there's, you know, I said two bailouts. Uh, there might be another bailout. There might be another set of big bailouts. Um, so, so there's debates about those, and um, and the uncertainty. I, th I think. So, so I. Th so some of the branches you go down is, you know, you can raise taxes on marginal tax rates on labor. You can raise marginal tax rates on capital. Um, those things have different kinds of distortions. Um, you know, you can tax the hell out of physical capital. You can tax human capital if you want. Um, you know, partly to address some of the issues you guys are doing, maybe, you know, these, 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 these inequality issues, not to get at the fundamentals, but to get at the kind of the outcomes. Um, and I, you know, relative to when I came out of college and President Eisenhower was president, and those guys, they, they just thought the budget had to be balanced, and there's kind of agreement. Kennedy thought the same thing. But, but now, um, it's part of why this balanced budget amendment got dropped, um, the way I see it is since for the last 20 years, there's been times when we've used the budget as kind of a game of chicken. You use the deficit as a game of chicken about who's going to back off first, who's going to create this fiscal crisis, and we're going to make the deficit grow and grow and grow, and sooner or later you're going to have to reduce expenditures, or you're going to have to increase taxes a lot, or you're going to have to def default, which is a way of increasing taxes on some people. So I see a lot more uncertainty than when I was in college, but maybe, maybe that's just because I'm older. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I come from a country and a region that has gone through many consequences on, of unpleasant arithmetics. And it's, no, it's not fun. Uh, I mean, if we draw a line or try to draw a line as Kevin did with GDP per capita in Latin America or countries like Mexico, you see huge kinks and, and, <laughs> and, and major distortions in that line. I mean, there is a real discontinuity and a flattening of the curve and even Holmes' downward movements, <laughs> just at the time of fiscal indiscipline. 
no? In discipline. In discipline, yeah. Uh, so you probably are not at the point where which other Europeans countries, as a matter of fact, are getting into, where basically your government is not subject to credit. And that's a really bad situation to be. <laughs> and in today's uh, world, uh, that generates huge costs in terms of GDP. It, it completely affects investment incentives. Uh, it affects you know, just what makes many of these economy, the market economy wrong, which is how do you anchor expectations, how do you reduce uncertainties in the future. Uh, so I, I think that, that uh, both for Europe and for the US, more for Europe than for, for the US, but I would include the US, it certainly would, would improve tremendously the economic functioning of your economy if that, that type of uncertainty is eliminated. No? I think that that would allow far better uh, business decisions, much better interpersonal decisions at the, at the household level. Um, and, and on the other side, you also would reduce a lot of downside risk in terms of your own economy. Because you don't only need to look into uh, you know, what limits you are imposing to the growth of your economy, but also you have to also look into the catastrophic risks. And I would say in the modern economies, the most important catastrophic events have been associated with uh, other than natural, dis na natural disasters and wars. It's basically poor fiscal policy and uh, bankruptcies uh, <coughs> that start solvency problems at the government level. And it's tremendously traumatic from a political point of view because then you have to decide who will bear the cost. And if you put in a society to debate who will be the loss of your past lassitudes, it's the most difficult political environment you can be in. And you and I come from a region where that has generated huge costs economically, socially, and politically. So you don't want to get there. You know, don't get there. <laughs> Byron? Uh, just uh, one point is that in terms of before getting there, which is the jump, you know, that, that uh, you're talking about. The idea is my belief is that as you have more uncertainty about government policies and how that's going to affect businesses and individual activities, that with more volatility or more, you need more risk capital. Uh, it's just obvious that you need more flexibility. You know, if you continue to have more noise, it's just valuable to buy options. Therefore, it means you need higher rates of <laughs> obviously, and it means that you need higher rates of return to engage in investment activity, so it's gonna dampen the effects on the economy, period. In our remaining time, I'd like to open it up to the audience for some questions. I'll start back here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I've been to a bunch of these postmortems post that have talked about the financial crisis, and this one's no different in that it looks at the problem as being how banks lost so much money so quickly to imperil the world financial system. And, and obviously, that is a real problem. But if we step back, uh, we might ask a bigger question. That is, what are banks doing now that gives them roughly double the share of GDP in this country that they had? Uh, 30 years ago, uh, and it, which is unseen in, uh, historically and unseen internationally, except perhaps in England. So um, what is it about English-speaking financial engineers that lets them so dominate uh, and, and generate so much revenue for their firms? Um, you know, to put it another way, why do English-speaking financial engineers overwhelmingly drive cars uh, designed by German and Japanese-speaking engineers? So, um, and. Um, the, the focus here really has is, is been on risk, and yet no one raised the issue that the risk that took down our banking system was that these firms create, they, they failed because they were carrying huge amounts of fraudulent mortgages that they had created. And the only distinction was that Bear and Lehman uh, got caught with them and Goldman got out of them. So how can you, in a, in a, in a, particularly a Chicago school where we believe incentives, how can we talk about the financial crisis without 
looking at the, the mantra of Wall Street, which is risk reward. I traded bonds at JP Morgan for 12 years. And, and that mantra, the risk reward on the financial crisis is getting worse and worse from a policy standpoint. If we look at the SNL crisis, we had people making a lot of money on fraudulent loans, and we had a lot of people going to jail. If you look at the dot-com bubble, we had people making... Just, uh, uh, evolve into a question. One more minute, one more minute. Okay. Uh, we, the dot-com bubble, we had a lot of people making a ton of money, and I think one guy from a major firm went to jail. Subprime mortgages, we had people making billions, and as it stands so far, not a single person from a major Wall Street firm has gone to jail. So I think that it's incumbent on Chicago in particular since Chicago, as, as uh, President Zimmer said, since Chicago is basically the brand name for market systems in the world, it's particularly in incumbent on Chicago to acknowledge that when a market system fails as, as egregiously as it has twice in 10 years, but most recently in the financial crisis, they have to be willing to say that, it, that it's not just mistakes. These are crimes, and until criminals are put in jail, it's going to happen again. And I th I th uh, that's where I stand on Chicago. I mean. It, uh, I, I, what, I, I came to Chicago. The, yeah. I think we got lost what the question is. Can you? Well, the, the question is, why doesn't <laughs> anyone talk thing. about fraud, uh, crime, and punishment in bank regulation when that was perhaps the central theme of, of the financial crisis? Okay, thank you. So let me, let me just rise to the defense of Chicago. Um, <laughs> actually, actually, so some of us are, are at Hoover. So there's a, uh, one, one of our colleagues at Hoover wrote a book. Um, is Marty Anderson, wrote a book, uh, he's a big person in the Reagan administration, and, and the book claims, I think falsely, that the Reagan administration proudly claims never read uh, or used a single academic paper in formulating any of its domestic <laughs> <laughs> one, So one of, one of my colleagues at Chicago, uh, Joseph Schenck, made a list of papers, that 10 papers the Reagan administration should have read. <laughs> and, and the first one, is by, it's, a, it's in the University of Chicago Journal. It's in 1978. It's by Carrick and Wallace. And it's about deregulation and deposit insurance, or lender of last resort. And, and they, they don't have jails in your thing, but, 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 it's, but they make a point very clearly. They say, um, if you have uh, poorly priced deposit insurance, as we do, um, then you create, you create incentives for banks to become as big as possible and as risky as possible. And you guarantee with probability one that in a certain amount of time they're going to fail and the taxpayers are going to have to bail them out. And then the, so what they say, that, this is before, uh, before Carter and Reagan's, um, actually Carter's monetary deregulation. They said if you're going to deregulate banks, you have to, um, you have to undo deposit insurance, or if you have deposit insurance, you have to regulate bank portfolios. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, um, that's your story. Right, but the bigger story is that we're, it's essentially an exercise in magical thinking to think that there's work that, that all these people who are very ordinary, I work with a lot of them, and you, you guys teach them, how can they suddenly be worth 500 grand three years out of school? And the answer okay. is they collect tolls, they engage in zero sum gaming, and, and they cheat the customers. Okay, we need to. Can I just interject here that, yep. um, uh, we heard I don't yeah, we, where you are, but you've already made your comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, and it's time to let somebody speak. Thank you. Question over here. <laughs> Freezing. <laughs> thank you. It's cold. Um, I'm an economist, but I also know a little bit of engineering, and I worked in the environment for a while. And for the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been working on global climate change. And I think there's a lesson that I've learned in global climate change that applies to economics, too. If you look at the literature on global climate change, such as is represented in the IPCC documents, you see that everything is very smooth. But in fact, if you look at what's happened to climate over the period of hundreds of, of millions of years, the changes when they occur are large and catastrophic. And so I've come to the conclusion that a lot of environmental science is misplaced. MIT, for instance, has a global climate model which has a million lines yeah, of... Yeah, we're a little bit short of time, so can, can we get to the key <laughs> question here? The key question is, my conclusion in environmental economics is that it's been misfocused, that it should have been focused on crises, 
And it's not been focused on crises. It's been focused on smooth changes. And the key focus in economics should be focused on crises, not on smooth changes. And one of the things that Friedman did was to try to set up situations. Okay, again, the, the question? That, that there's a That's my question. OK. Right. And one of the things that Friedman did, <laughs> and I'm going to say, what is your opinion about it? <laughs> one of the things that Friedman did was to say, let's set up a system which is less likely to generate crises. Okay. So what's your opinion about the fact that economic science should be refocused to look at crises, not smooth things? I, would, I can say something. <laughs> Even that, I lost the microphone. <laughs> Here it is. Well, very simple. In Mexico, we had many crises. We studied them. And this time, <laughs> and we learned, and this time we're not in trouble. So at the end of the day, you can learn, and you can get out of your crisis. And Chile, too. And Chile, too. Chile too. Okay. Right, but, but you're right. Uh, no, I'm I mean, sorry. Was, we need to go on to others. Um, question right here. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. <laughs> uh, very quick. Why hasn't private insurance somehow gotten involved in protecting against the risks of the financial markets? I don't understand. What was the question? Why, why didn't private insurance? Uh, well, we did have some of it through the monoline insurance companies, but they went broke. So, uh, <laughs> uh, some things are uh, easy to insure against, and some things are very difficult to insure against. And the crisis problem is that um, when they tried to insure the, um, the structured products and that, that they had uh, uh, <clears throat> didn't take account of the outliers or the crisis thing, and that all the monoline insurance companies that did that went broke. Could that have been regulated yeah. better, yeah. the insurance yeah. as opposed to the banking? Did you want, Tom? Did yeah, you know, you know, there, so this is very, so there used to be uh, a lot more self-insurance and, and coalitions of banks that were like, um, like clearing houses. In, in order to get into those things, you had to, they did a lot of insuring and monitoring, and the Fed put them out of business. Question right over here. Just a quick question from Myron. Just as a follow-up, are there too many free options in the economy? <laughs> uh, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you know, if, you, if someone's going to give you a, an option and not charge you for it, then basically you're going to take it, I mean, uh, or it to be underpriced. So that, uh, unfortunately, it's, um, you know, that's part of this, uh, too big to fail. It's part of this idea about insurance and the government insuring it and insuring bondholders. There's an implicit option or an explicit option. It's valuable and people try to use that option. There's a question over here. Yeah. Just a minute, there'll be a mic. Hey, if I interpreted Professor Scholes correctly that too big to fail, we have that problem and it's a problem, what's the solution? Breaking up Banks, or what would you say? Well, my, my natural my natural thing is to try to have market discipline. You know, we have to figure out a new accounting system. We have to figure out a way in which we, as outsiders, can monitor the risks of the entities in which we're lending money to, and that that is missing right now. Entire that's one thing we have to work. We our accounting system was built uh, for none of this. If I tell you the derivative positions of a bank. I don't know whether their exposure is net short, net long, or neutral, or what's gonna, how it's going to change. There's no way to measure that right now. If we look at the banks now, we have no mark to market. The banks have guarantees. We have no way of knowing what the, what the guarantees are or how they're going to change over time. Instead of talking about these capital rules that they're doing, let's talk about a dynamics of the system. Let's figure out ways in which people can understand dynamics, and then maybe it's the case that we'd have debt holders being able to monitor the banks, and I would rely on individuals who lend money to banks to monitor more readily than I would central bankers or these regulatory bodies. So we're going the wrong way as opposed to the correct way. How do we aggregate risks in society? That's a huge problem. 
you know, these li things, liquidity dries up, you get these shocks occurring. And so do we know all the risks in the, that are out there? Maybe the systemic risk regulators or whatever should be in the business of aggregating risk and disseminating the aggregated risk to the marketplace without naming names. People maybe make more rational decisions about risks that are in the economy and therefore uh, constrain uh, entities uh, from taking those risks. I think we have time for one last question. Let's take the general. The questioner, um, the, le the lengthy questioner, uh, made the suggestion that markets had failed during the recent financial crisis. And I think there's a title of a book by uh, Judge Posner in Chicago suggesting the same thing. But when I think about the financial institutions that failed and threatened the financial system by so doing, I think they were all regulated institutions. Was the recent financial crisis a failure of markets? Or was it a failure because we, as a society, relied on regulators to do things that they really are not well equipped to do? For this non-trivial question, I think we'll have some short answers if anyone would like <laughs> yeah, to volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> is the Carrick and Wallace model working like a charm? Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> Myron, did? Yeah. I, well, actually, the question is, what does it mean markets fail or don't fail? If we have a situation, bring some of the questions together. If we look at the past and it's been smooth and easy, it looks like markets are working. If we get a shock occurring, markets are going to work in a different way. We have to integrate across all of these conditions and states. And the idea, if we only like the smooth world and not the discord world, then we say markets didn't work. But markets will work as they should because in a time of shock, Markets have to have time to figure out what the new equilibriums are, and basically, or inter intermediation costs go up dramatically, and that's how it's going to work. That prices are going to change, but you have to have intermediaries or people coming in that are going to supply these services. Okay. You want to agree? I, let me see. Yes, please. Well, I think markets have worked very well. Now that the outcome has not been the one that we like. <laughs> That's a different thing. But if you follow through the incentives and how is that reflected in supply and demand, uh, we have come to this terrible outcome. No? Now, I wouldn't throw the market economy out the window because of this. I would focus more precisely on how, how can we improve incentives and, and information and asymmetries for markets to work better. I mean, in a way, I, I certainly yeah. agree with Myron. Now, now, the point is you have to get also into a situation of the world where, where things can move forward. And, and, and therefore, we have to uh, tackle it from different points of view, from the point of view of regulators, from the point of view of information, from the point of view of accounting, from the legal point of view, from the informational point of view. I agree with Myron. I mean, accounting is supposed to give information, and, and it, right now there, there are not even single accounting standards in the financial industry in the world. So this, what, what we have seen today is the fact that many things at the same time failed at the same simultaneously. And I think we need to address them in that way. But that doesn't mean that markets are not working. It is, it is true that there were not financial crises in the Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so before I call, uh, before I call on Andy Alper, for some, uh, the chairman of the board of trustees, for some concluding remarks, I'd like to thank all three panelists for their um, excellent responses.